Please welcome today's speaker, Dr. Desmond Ford. I want you to imagine that you are a slave, a Roman slave, nearly 2,000 years ago. And you are sneaking a few hours off from the plantation and you are wandering freely through the streets of Rome. And suddenly one foot kicks a bundle of papers and you pick them up. Wonder what this is about. And he looks at the first words that his eye can interpret and it reads like this. All things are yours. The world or life or death or things present, or things to come. He thinks to himself, all things are mine, all I own is a few rags, the ones I'm wearing. This man must have been an idiot. Maybe he's escaped from some asylum. All things are yours, the world, life, death, things present, things to come. And then around the corner comes Dominic. He knows Dominic. Dominic's also a slave, but he's a Christian slave. Now, you don't know much about Christians or Christianity. All you know is that Dominic is a very nice bloke. Dominic, come here. I've just found some silly papers. Some idiot has written stupid things here. It says on this paper, all things are yours. The world, life, death. Things present, things to come. Who on earth could write something like that? Dominic pats you on the shoulder. He says, Stephanus, your problem is you don't know about the Christian gospel. Well, tell me, what's it all about? All right, Stephanus, I'll tell you. These words have been written by a man who was once a murderer but is now a great lover of all people. Because he was met on a suicidal journey by Christ, the Messiah. You've heard of him, Stephanus. The Jews have always looked for a great king to come. Well, he's come. And the Romans here crucified him. But he's alive, Stephanus. He's alive. And he met this murderer who wrote those words. Let me tell you what it means. It means that if you become a Christian, this whole world only exists for you. There's not a speck on it that's not yours. Of course, you're not of full age yet, but you are the heir of it. You know, the Messiah said to his followers, you are the salt of the earth. Now, salt preserves, salt conserves. Stephanus, if there weren't any Christians here, the world would disappear. Only because of Christians does God permit this wicked Roman world to go on with its slavery, its wars, its thefts, its lusts. God asks the flames to tarry a while till he's taken all the Christians out of this world. Stephanus, you ought to become one. Otherwise, otherwise, when this world is burned up, you ought to become a Christian. Yes, the world is yours, Stephanus, because it belongs to our God, who became man and who died for you. The world or life? Stephanus, life, you think, is only for slavery. No, life is for love and laughter. Life is for learning and for teaching, for giving and for serving, and for enduring, Stephanus. We know what that is, don't we? Enduring. But you know, Stephanus, if life was always like a birthday party, would we be worth knowing? Even the tough things in life are needed. But life is essentially for love and laughter. And we're only here to tell the world that God loves them, what Colin was saying. That's why you exist. That's the only reason you exist, 
Tell the world that despite its follies and its weaknesses, its stupidity and its murders and its lusts, the Creator loves it. The world or life or death, well, now you say death, that's nothing but evil. Oh, no, no. This same man who wrote those papers you've come across, he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And your eyes blink open. That's ridiculous. Whoever thought of death being gain? That's just as stupid as the beginning about the world being ours. How on earth can death be considered ours? Well, it's like this, Stephanus. You don't know the story, but there was a wicked old king, Belshazzar, who once saw a hand right on the wall. Many, many tackle you fasten. You're weighed in the balances and found wanting. No, I don't know anything about that. But the king was scared because he only saw the hand. And most people only see the hand of death, the approach, the clamminess, the sighing, the crying. That's only the hand of death. If you are a believer, death, becomes the portal to eternal joys. That's what that man meant when he said, life and death are for us. Death in its evil aspects has been abolished. Christ destroyed it on the cross where the Romans placed him. The world is yours, Stephanus. Life is yours. Death is yours if you're a believer. You've got to understand this. This is what I tell myself all the time, Stephanus. No evil can happen to me. Seeming ill is only another form of benediction. And if everything shall help me, what matter in what dress it comes? Fine linen and scarlet or sackcloth and ashes? If you're a believer, the bitter is sweet. The medicine is food. I say to myself, Stephanus, you'll meet nothing but friends between here and the pearly gates. Or if you meet an enemy, it'll be a conquered one. Every wind that tosses the Atlantic of my life pushes my bark towards its desired haven, heaven. Every wind, whether it's soft or fierce, is a divine monsoon from my heavenly lover to lead me all the way home. So, Stephanus, if you're a believer, no evil can happen to you. Seeming ill is only another form of benediction. For when the light of the world passes by, then we see privileges in all hardships. We see order in confusion. We see gain in loss. We see life in death. You should become one, Stephanus. Then Stephanus points ahead. What's that mark on the road? Well, that's your ignorance again, Stephanus. That's a cross. Well, what's it doing there? Well, let's stand here and watch. And as Dominic and Stephanus stand on the side of the road, people begin to come, but they're different people. They all look very happy. And they're all clean. They're different. And they all look at the mark. And they go to the left or the right and then go ahead. Stephanus says, to me, where are they going? They're going to the catacombs. Why on earth would anyone go to the catacombs? Because that's the resting place for dead Christians. And there's 597 miles of catacombs around this city of Rome, Stephanus. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. But Dominic, everybody here burns the dead. I've heard that in Greece they just burn the dead. Are you telling me that Christians don't, as a rule, always burn the dead? Yes, that's what I'm telling you. It wouldn't really matter much because Christians are sometimes burnt to ashes by the Romans. But as a rule, they, they don't. They believe in resurrection. They believe they'll live again because life and death are for the believer. Are you telling me there are 597 miles of burial grounds in these catacombs. That's right. How many people are there? About 7 million. What? 
you're telling me that around Rome, this city, this wicked city, there are about 7 million people who've lived and died believing in the Jewish Messiah. That's right. Dominic takes his arm. Come with me, we'll see what happens. And so they go about half a mile, Appian Way. Then suddenly there's an aperture on the side of the road that leads downward. And they follow with the others that have preceded them till they come to a great subterranean meeting chamber. Hundreds of people are there. And Stephanus says, what's this all about? Well, the big fisherman's going to speak. Well, who's the big fisherman? That's Peter. He was the chief of the apostles. He's the one that denied the Messiah. And he's wept ever since when he's heard a rooster crow. But he's going to speak. Let's go and listen. So they draw an ear and Peter's saying something like this. The world and life is a riddle. But the solution lies in one fact. God. But God is a riddle, and the solution lies in one fact, Christ. He was the infinite one, but he became an infant. He was the eternal one, but he became born of a woman. He was the almighty, and yet he was carried around Bethlehem in the arms of a Jewish girl. He supported the whole universe, but he was carried by a young virgin until he could walk. He was the king of the angels, but people thought he was just Joseph's son. He was the heir of all things, but people said he's just a carpenter's bastard. But Peter warms up. Those of us who knew him, there was no one that loved like Jesus. It had been predicted of him in the Old Testament. He'd bind up the brokenhearted. He'd preach liberty to the captives. He would give a crown of beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the spirit of praise for the spirit of heaviness. He would open the blind eyes. He'd make the lame to walk. He'd raise the dead. It's all in the Old Testament, Stephanus. Stephanus. And that's what he did. He bound up the brokenhearted because he loved everybody. He even loved lepers. He even loved harlots. And when they crucified him, he loved his crucifiers. I remember, said Peter, how patient he was with us. We were a difficult bunch. We had a few terrorists among the 12, some fishermen, but we were difficult. Some were terribly ambitious. And we had one amongst us who was a devil who betrayed him. His name was Judas. Strange thing, you know, Jesus had a brother called Judas. But I remember once when a group of people wouldn't, uh, wouldn't accept Jesus, we said, well, we call down fire from heaven like Elijah. And he said to us, you don't know what spirit you are of. The Son of Man has come to save men's lives, not to destroy them. And I remember the night on the lake, terrible storm. The waves were flooding into our little ship. And he was asleep. At last we shook him and said, don't you care? We're perishing. And he very slowly got up and said to the water, peace, be still. And the wind died away and the sea became calm. Then he said to us, why are you fearful? What are you worried about? Then there was another time when there was another storm and he wasn't with us. And we were scared to death because we thought the ship was going to go down. And then we saw a ghost coming along the, the water, a ghost walking on the water. And we cried out in fear. And then we heard the voice of Jesus. It's me. Don't be afraid. It's me. And when he got near, we saw it was Jesus. Peter said, when I knew it was Jesus, I said, if it's you, 
call me to come. Jesus said, come. And I got out and I walked on the water. But suddenly I caught out of the corner of my eye a big wave coming and I took my eyes off the master and I began to go down and down and down and he reached down and picked me up. Oh, if only I had learnt the lesson, I would not have done that terrible deed a year later. If only I had learned that I've got to keep looking to him, not look at the waves, not look at the troubles, not look at the sorrow, but look to him. I remember, says Peter, that after he had died on the cross and before that there had been Gethsemane and when the soldiers came to take him, he said, if you want me, let these go their way. Fancy that, said Peter. Fancy that. He was going to be taken to be spat upon and to be flogged and to be crucified and he thought of us. If you want me, let these go their way. Fancy that. No one loved like Jesus, said Peter. And you know, when I betrayed him in Pilate's judgment hall, with cursing and swearing, I said I didn't know him. He turned and looked on me and it was not a look of reproof. It was not a rebuke. It was a look of love. And that saved me from doing what Judas did. But for that look, I would have suicided that very day. On the third day, after his death, the big stone was rolled away from the sepulchre and he came out. And the first person he saw was Mary Magdalene, out of whom he'd cast seven devils. And she was weeping, so she didn't see who he was. She thought he was the gardener. Well, he was the gardener. The church is his garden and Christ is the gardener. Sir, if you've taken him away, tell me so I can look after him's body. And he said to her, Mary, she looks up, brushes away her tears, Rabboni, Rabboni. And after that he was seen by other women and then by all of us disciples and finally he met with 500 believers. And he spent six weeks with us here on earth telling us many things. Imagine that. The resurrected Christ, staying around for six weeks. If it had been me, I'd been back in heaven in a flash. But he stayed in this wicked earth. Taught us for six weeks, Stephanus. So Peter now is communicating via Dominic to Stephanus the things that Stephanus doesn't understand or explain to him, sotto voce. And then Peter says, there's a third riddle. We talked about the riddle of the world and life, solution is God. We talked about the riddle of God, the solution is Christ. But there's another riddle, Stephanus. There's a riddle of death for you and I and everybody around us. We're dying. We're dying. And most people in this Roman world think that's the end. So they say, let's eat and drink and fornicate and murder and steal, for death is the end. But fortunately, that's not true. If you're a believer, the riddle of death finds its solution in the risen Christ. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. So Stephanus, if you respond to his love, you become part of him, like a branch in the vine, like a little corpuscle in the body. You become part of him. Because he lives, you'll live also. You can live forever. But now Peter's talking again and Peter's saying, do you want to know, do you want to be certain that the riddle of death is solved for you? Can you know today that death has no terrors for you, that you will certainly be raised by the risen Christ? Can you know? And then Peter says, yes, you can. Jesus said on the last night before he was taken, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples 
because you love one another. And then Peter begins to say something very beautiful. Fortunate us have never heard it before. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I become sounding brass and a tinkling cymbals. And though I have the gift of prophecy and all knowledge and faith to move mountains, though I have not love, I'm nothing. And though I give my body to be burned and give all my goods to feed the poor and have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love envies not. Wanteth not itself, is not puffed up, is not provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. What a thing is this love. It bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things. And where there be prophecies, I'll cease. Where there be tongues, I'll be no more. Where there's knowledge, it'll vanish away. For now we only know in part. Then we'll know even as also we are known. For now we see in a misty mirror, darkly. But then we will know. Now we know in part. But then I'll know even as also I am known. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. And now abides faith, hope, love, and the greatest of these is love. And now Peter leans forward and he says, my dear brothers and sisters, you don't have to be very smart, you don't have to be beautiful, you don't have to be handsome, you don't even have to be, in the Roman sense, free. You can know the truth and that'll make you free. But when you receive the truth, you become like him who was the way, the truth and the life. You'll begin to love like him. And that means you already have partaken of eternal life and that life can never be taken from you. And now you, as Fortunatus, feel the chains fall off your arms. For now you're free. You realise you belong to him and he belongs to you. And you have eternal life. This program has been paid for by the partners and friends of Good News Unlimited. Word spreads fast.